Coming up on DTNS, Google wants to pick your news, a robot to help you read terms of service, and who's at fault for the Uber self-driving car death. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, November 20th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood's mom's house, I'm Sarah Lane. From a rainy Salt Lake City, I'm Scott, Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson. Oh, and uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. I thought you were going to go for a new nickname, Skull Johnson. Skull Johnson. Yep, I'm you just put, a, you put a, pinch, a pinch of me between your cheek and gum. More like the King Kong <laughs> Skull Island kind of feel yeah, is what I was I going with. Better. Hey, uh, we were just talking about the magic bullet. Uh, remember that? And uh, fried chicken and ladybug infestations and all kinds of other good stuff on Good Day Internet. And if you want to be a part of that fun conversation, you got to become a member right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook's experimental app employees called the NPE team have released Whale, an app that lets you decorate photos with text and stickers. A meme creator, if you will, that's the idea anyway. It's free to use with no in-app purchases or subscriptions. The app is only available in Canada for now though. The NPE team is charged by Facebook with rapidly developing apps to experiment with new ideas. Speaking of Facebook, Facebook also announced its F8 developer conference will take place May 5th and 6th in 2020 at the McHenry Convention Center in San Jose, California. You can sign up to get notified when registration will open at F, like the other F, 8.com. If you hit the F8 key on your keyboard, it doesn't, it doesn't register. <laughs> oh, it won't we'll automatically no. go there? Dang. No, I tried. Alibaba has set a likely price of 176 Hong Kong dollars for its secondary stock listing. Uh, remember, they're on the New York Stock Exchange, but they're also going to be now on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, that's the price for institutional investors, but a CNBC source says that's likely to be around the same level for retail investors as well. Apple launched a lineup of battery cases for the iPhone 11, 11 Pro, and 11 Pro Max in the same black, white, and pink colors as their predecessors, and also with wireless charging support. What's new, though, is a physical button that auto-opens the iPhone's camera app, even if the phone is locked. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what went wrong with Disney Plus last weekend, Scott. Well, The Verge reports that the head of Disney's direct-to-consumer division, Kevin Mayer, says difficulties with Disney Plus app at launch had to do with the way the company, quote, architected the app. A lot of us would say developed or made, whatever. It's a fun word. Anyway, Mayer said that the BAM Tech, a.k.a. Disney streaming services, had never seen the high volume of streams when, uh, uh, you know, when, when hosting things like HBO and MLB. It exposed the, quote, limits to the architecture. Mayer says Disney will recode the app within the next couple of weeks and fix the issues affecting that kind of stuff so you won't have a problem in the future. Like, hey, I, I got kicked out of my movie uh, or I had to leave and I came back and I started and it made me start over that sort of stuff. They, they pointed out, they're going to try to fix as well. Yeah, I think I, it's good to hear. I think architecting the app is actually, uh, I think he's trying to say, it's not just the way we developed it. It's that we structured it to follow a certain path when it does things. And we didn't, understand just how big the demand would be for this. I mean, to say this is the biggest demand that BAMTech has ever seen is saying something. BAMTech has handled the largest streaming events in in uh, some of anyway, the largest streaming events uh, launches any anyway that have ever existed. HBO Now with the Game of Thrones coming back was huge for BAMTech and they weathered it fairly well, even though it had some problems back then. Uh, so this was just gargantuan. This is unprecedented. And when that happens, it starts to expose things where when you were developing the app, you architected in a way, say, well, then it's going to go over here and make that call. And, you know, that can handle 10 million at once. So that ought to be fine. And then suddenly you get 100 million and you're like, oh, I should be, you know, changing this so that it's not all 100 million going at once and swamping the server. Uh, I should be logging, continue watching in, in, a, in a place in memory that doesn't get flushed out and then people don't get to continue watching. I'm making this up, but those are the kinds of things that can happen. And that explains to me why you had these weird issues that weren't related to streaming. It's not like they didn't have enough bandwidth. It's not like they didn't have enough servers. It wasn't simple like that. It was the actual architecture of the app. That makes a lot more sense to me. Yeah, no, it's I don't. Also, it's also, you can imagine like two different conference rooms right where the it guys are like this is the worst and the producer people are like 
we have lots of demands, you know, it's like, it's kind of, it's kind of a, like a, 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 it's a good situation to be in depending on who you ask. Yeah, that's true. But also I would argue it, it's easy to look at and be critical, but I would actually argue given the demand, given the fact that this wasn't a measured rollout the way HBO now was, where it was only available on Apple, Apple TV at first, and then they went to other platforms and kind of took it in a different way. Having this all land on the same day on every platform, on all these different apps, on a pretty varied, you know, group of, of, of ecosystems and have it go as well as it did, I think is kind of impressive. So I'm sure there's room for concern and I'm sure that it's great for them to look back and say, well, here's what we could have done different. And I'm even sure it's OK for them to do that in light of shareholder concerns about how well it went and how retention is going to go as a result. But it worked pretty good. Like I was having problems the first day a little, but I kind of did get in that day. And then from the day after that, I had no problems and I haven't really had any problems since. I think they did pretty good, all things considered. I've seen a lot worse launches of a lot worse services, so it's not so bad. Google Assistant has a new feature called Your News Update that can be played by telling the assistant to listen to the news. Google assembles the update from various Google partners based on what it knows about you, including your location, among other parameters. Among several dozen participating partners are Fox News, the NBA, Al Jazeera, Wired, and more. Stories in your updates can come from multiple sources, with the source read out before the news item plays, so you know what you're listening to and you know where it came from. Updates generally start with big national and international stories, followed by local news, and then more personalized bits, like sports, for example. You can go into assistant settings to prioritize or mute various sources. Yeah. And one of the things I found out when I went to set it up is if you already have news set up in Google Assistant, it's not going to give you this new algorithmically generated one. It's just going to give you whatever you set up before. So I got the BBC when I tried this and I'm like, wait, that's not right. Uh, and I went and I had to go into the settings for Google Assistant, which eh, depending on how you're doing it, I was doing it on my Pixel 4, uh, can can be a little little tricky to find. But once you find it, then you say, oh, give me the Your News update. And I did that. And once I got it going, it, sa it said, OK, pick a few sources. But even if you pick sources, it's not going to limit it to those sources. It's going to try to bust you out of your bubble and show you things that maybe you wouldn't have chosen that it thinks you'll like anyway, based on what Google knows about you. And the more Google knows about you, the more accurate it's going to be. Mine was interesting. I, I didn't like the sources available, honestly. BBC is my go-to, and it wasn't on there. Uh, and also, the first time I tried it, it played the same story from CBS News back-to-back. -back. Like. Mm -hmm. It, it started, it gave me two world stories, well, actually two national stories, U.S. national stories, and, and they were the same. They were the exact same recording. So it might be a few bugs to work out. I don't know. <laughs> the local stuff wasn't bad, though. It was actually uh, the Santa Rosa power outages were on there and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a thing about uh, a, a, an event up in Santa Clarita, which is just north of Santa Rosa. Well, although Washington. Santa Rosa isn't really local to you, but I suppose, you know, if you're it was like state thinking news, like state right? local. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, this this whole idea is, and like you mentioned, it's not going to work that well. The same way that if I use a streaming music service and, it, you know, I kind of hit like uh, selected for you radio. It's like, eh, you know, sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they don't get it right. But it's interesting, especially, you know, Spotify's news yesterday about trying to, you know, handpick uh, at cherry pick play uh, play podcast playlists for people. This is, you know, an extension of the same thing. It's like. You know, it should machine learning try to figure out what it knows about me enough that it could deliver me in the news that I want? Well, I don't know. That has yet to be determined. But I, I, I like the idea of it in theory. Yeah. What I like is eventually we get to a place where deeper data can be found. Like if Google's good at anything, it's integrating search into every one of their products in a way that's useful. And what I would love this to be able to do is say, it's clear Scott really likes tech news. So I'm going to pull the morning headlines from the daily tech news show feed or whatever. I'm going to play something from somewhere that isn't just a mainstream partner like these guys. That's when I know they've really made it with this. When yeah. they can dig a little deeper, go a little further. Um, I mean, that has other implications like uh, extreme sources of news and whether you want any of that in your feed or not. So part of me likes the idea of curating partners, but uh, I, I feel like this is a good step in the right direction, and I actually look forward to using it, even though I mostly use uh, Google's Assistant on my iOS devices. 
the robot lawyer behind the do not pay parking ticket dispute service. Remember, we've, we've talked about that for years. It, it'll automatically file things to kind of help resolve your parking ticket for on your behalf. Has a new service called Do Not Sign that is included in the Do Not Pay $3 subscription. Do Not Sign will let you upload, scan, or link to a license agreement, like a terms of service type thing. The service then uses machine learning to highlight clauses it thinks you might want to know about and any methods for opting out of data collection. It'll even send letters on your behalf to opt out, just like it does with the parking ticket stuff. Uh, Do Not Sign is available in the United States on the web and in the, its iOS app. Uh, Man. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, just the fact that something like this exists uh, just goes to show you how how bamboozled you can get by by license agreements. Otherwise, uh, I you know I I haven't had an uh, opportunity to use this, but uh, I can think of lots of uh, scenarios where, if for some reason it could help me, you yes. know, figure out like, hey, is this is this legal? Do I what do I got to do here? You know, should I sign? Should I not? I I do it. Some years ago, there was somebody, and I don't know where the link is anymore, if it even exists anymore, but there was, and I, I brought this up with Tom this morning, but there was an, a lawyer who was just, and this was human controlled, obviously not machine learning, but it was somebody who was taking common EULAs from various common services. And I felt like there was kind of a gaming bent to it if my memory serves. So it was like Sony's uh, EULA or Microsoft's Xbox or something. But anyway, it would take these and boil them down to one or two small paragraphs of the, of the gist of it. Like the gist of what you're giving up, what you're signing off, what they can take away from you, what they can cancel you for, these sorts of things. And I really liked that because I'm not going to read the nine-page uh, scroll that pops up when I install a new version of World of Warcraft or whatever. I'm not going to see what terms change for Blizzard. I'm just going to hit OK and, and assume that I'm going to be OK. And I really liked that because somehow it just made me feel like somebody out there was watching out for other people. Maybe the robots can do it. They can <laughs> look out for their their human uh, owners and make us all do better. I don't know. I, I would I will probably use this, I guess, is what I'm circling around here to. Uh, it, it makes sense to me to to try to simplify that process. If we're not going to legally make these guys make that stuff more common languagey and easier to understand, then I don't know. We'll work. We'll do a workaround. And here's. Here's a workaround. Yeah, I, I like this um, because it reminds me of Eulalizer. That's another service that was attempting to do this, but it didn't really have the machine learning. It was it was doing some other tricks to try to analyze license agreements and, and highlight things. And it's not just about privacy. I mean, some of this stuff is compliant with the GDPR and still in the terms of service. So you have to, be, you know, you still have to look at it, even though it's more, it's more, it has to be more plain language with the GDPR, it has to be more upfront. This still might be helpful for stuff, but it's also, they have one example in this Verge article about a gym that basically put in its terms of service that you couldn't cancel unless you moved away. Like you, you were st like stuck in the gym forever, which can't be legal. But again, like, are you gonna take them to court? Or, you know, are you going to find some other way around it? And this was the do not sign was able to find the loophole that said, tell them you moved and then they have to cancel your service. Oh, I man, I didn't know about that one. If that was if that's a thing that happens, what needs to happen there is just a good round of public shaming for that gym so that they take it out of there and never do that again, because that's terrible to yeah. do that to your users. My gosh. Well, and, and this is, that's the other advantage of this kind of service is it will bring more of those sorts of abuses to light. Yeah, good point. Well, something that I think is actually very positive is Google adding new tools to Google Earth that lets you set landmarks, draw lines from one place to another, add text, add images, even add videos to every point along any particular journey, and then share it with your loved ones or whoever you want to. Google is also experimenting with pre-made tours. It's calling them stories, which is a term that, I don't know, it references lots of things. But if it sounds familiar to you, Google Earth already had guided tours in its Voyager tab. The new tools now allow anyone to make and share a tour and then invite others to collaborate on their tour. Uh, web only for now, so it's not on mobile, but Google says you can view tours on the latest versions of iOS and Android. So it's uh, it's getting there. 
Google Earth already had something similar to this, but they were all like professionally done, you know, by, yeah. by documentarians and stuff. So this is a chance for you to just be like, hey, I, you know, I, I had a great trip to Minneapolis uh, and here are the cool things I did there and then share it with your friends. I, I was joking that it, it could also be used for bragging if you go on some like amazing Caribbean vacation or something like but that. I mean, but sure. I mean, but like brag, but I still want to like follow along on what mm -hmm. you did. Like, was it that great? Let's see. Where'd you go? What'd you yeah. do? You know, well, like, if, if you're going to the same place as someone else went, this is a great way to pick up some tips. Yeah, this will this will solve a problem. I have a very specific problem, which is we get every year people on my morning show ask us about the best places to go when you're in Vegas because we go to Vegas mm -hmm. a lot. We have a big meetup there. We're there a few times a year, and it makes sense that we might have some suggestions. So here's a great way to say, instead of having to explain it in 50 emails or build an email template about it, I can just link them to this, to this map. And say, here's all the places that we recommend going. You've got pictures. You've got everything along the way. Like, I think it's a kind of a, a brilliant thing. And a little surprised they didn't make this available more, I don't know, sooner to the more broad public. I think well, and the, and the era of Airbnb and uh, Google Street View and being able to sort of virtually be in a place that you've never been before. Or maybe you've been before, but, you know, you're, you're figuring out how you're going to do it better the next time kind of thing. When, when it's your friend, you know, Tom and Eileen go to Japan. They come back and they say that we had the best two weeks of our lives. Here's everywhere we went. You got to do with this. Like, that is so motivating for me. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you have to do it all while you're there. You can do this later, right. as I understand it. Yeah. So you're not like, you're. It's, this isn't a system where you're like, okay, hold on a second. Before we get off the bus, I got to hurry up and do the post about what train we took. Like, it's not like that. You can go later and say, all right, what pictures did we take? Ooh, this would be mm -hmm. good to have up here. And we went to Fuji and blah, 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 blah. Like, that's a, that, that, I mean, honestly, I would love to follow one of Tom's trip to Japan or Hawaii. <laughs> yes. or where all right, hints no. taken, everyone. I will definitely <laughs> document our trip to Japan. And so I would like to be included in your trip to Japan. But if you we guys can, can come be, with me. Better, come better get into Google Earth, Asa. Yeah, get in there. Uh, hey, I want to say uh, this first. Big thanks to SB Sheridan for submitting this on the subreddit. Bill Gates backed energy company Heliogen. If you haven't heard of it, it's because neither did I and nobody else did. It's kind of a little secrety thing, but it's finally uh, making some noise. Anyway, they have used computer vision software and automatic edge detection to direct a field of mirrors to use sunlight to create temperatures above 1,000 degrees Celsius. That is very, very warm. Uh, about a quarter of the temperature of the surface of the sun. That's just how warm. The solar heat could be used to make uh, cement, steel, glass, other materials, no carbon emissions. The next step is to demonstrate the process at scale. It may be a little tricky, we'll see. Anyway, later on, Heliogen believes it may be able to create hydrogen at scale as well. Kind of yeah, a big deal. One of the things I noticed in, in this article is, is the Heliogen people are at least saying that uh, they can demonstrate at scale. This is not like, well, now we have to solve how to do it at scale, which is often the case with scientific studies. Like, well, we did it in the lab, but now we have to figure out how to do it practically. They are like, this is practical. We just now have to, we did we did a one-off to just prove that, and now we know how to scale it, and we'll do that next. So it'll be interesting to see if they follow up on what they say they can do. But if they can, uh, this would take out a huge carbon emitter uh, if it's uh, adopted by industry and save a lot of power to boot. Yeah, there was a, um, you know that, I don't remember the name of it, but Bill Gates has, there's a documentary series about Bill Gates on Netflix. It's a Netflix original. They follow him around. And a big part of it is like, here's one of the innovations we're working on. And then they'll kind of show the work in progress and show the people involved in it. It's very good. I liked it a lot. And they also end up disperse it with questions like, why were you so hated in the 90s? Or were, did you and Steve Jobs really hate each other? So you get plenty of that drama. But really, it's about these things he's investing money in. And one of them was this self, uh, not perpetual machine, but basically it was an energy source for a small village that could run perpetually and not have any carbon emissions, never need new fuel. Like, that was the goal, was to create something that just kind of kept on pumping. I have to think, because I never mentioned this thing, I have to think that this is somehow connected to that. or to It's not. At the very least, it's connected to his goal. It's not, because this isn't creating energy, this is creating heat. Sure, but if you're creating hydrogen at scale, which they just say they're not. They they're do. saying they think they could adapt this to do that at some point, but they right. haven't got to that yet. Right, I was just saying that. So if they, if that's what they're saying, and if they do, and if they can, then that means a whole lot of demonstrable uh, capability here, not just, hey, we can heat stuff up real good. 
So I mean, I have, honestly, no, I disagree with you. This is this this tech particular technology is we can heat stuff stuff up real good, uh, and that at this level of heat is incredibly useful uh, without even getting into electrical generation. You don't think it has any any potential for for? Well, no. I mean, of course, I'm not going to say that because uh, we we use heat to burn coal and push generators. So yeah, maybe this could uh, you know push a generator to create electricity too. But I don't. I don't know that that's the biggest advantage of this. I, I think I, there are more efficient ways to do that. I, I do understand it because the French developed one that looks very similar in their setup to heat a t water tower to generate steam to, for power mm -hmm. generation, but it isn't on the same. It in isn't fact, this is this too system. powerful for that, yes. right? Because you'd melt the tower. <laughs> yeah, your steam wouldn't be steam very long. You'd have, it, it would. Yeah. It, your steam, steam would be the steam. tower, like you'd have the tower would turn to steam. I just bet, just the I bet there's a lot of wiggle room between zero and a thousand degrees Celsius where they could find. Oh effort. yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that. You know, there, there's all kinds of of derivative technologies that might come out of this as well. But I think those are actually fairly common. Like Roger says, there's other projects. The the real big advancement here is is to be able to create create this kind of heat at a sustainable, useful level. People have tried to do it before, and they just couldn't quite get it to this level. At a hearing Tuesday, the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board determined cause and responsibility for the death of a pedestrian who was hit by an Uber autonomous car. Safety driver Rafaela Vasquez was found partially at fault for being distracted by her phone. Uber's Advanced Technologies Group was also partially found to be at blame for inadequate safety procedures and ineffective monitoring of vehicle operators. Uber did not have a system to keep safety drivers from becoming complacent. So all three of those things, uh, the NTSB said, now Uber, you are partially to blame for this death as well. And the victim herself, Elaine Hertzberg, was found partially at fault for having methamphetamines in her system, which may have impaired judgment when crossing outside the crosswalk. And the state of Arizona was found partially to blame for its insufficient policies to regulate autonomous vehicles and encourage Uber to put in place the proper safety procedures and to make sure that that there were regulations to ensure safety. This is obviously, you know, not a fun topic, but I think what I find most interesting about this decision is it points the light on the fact that we all want to just say, well, it was it was the pedestrian's fault. Uh, she, she, she shouldn't have crossed outside the crosswalk. Well, it was the driver's fault. She shouldn't have been on, on her phone. No, it's Uber's fault. They're an irresponsible company. Uh, it's the state's fault. They should have regulated things better. And the fact is, yes, yes, to all four of those. Everyone had something they could have done better to prevent this. And man, can you imagine if we spent that amount of time and care in determining the blame in a regular auto accident that didn't <laughs> here, involve here, an autonomous car uh, yeah. of 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 the uh, of these uh, of these readings the one that sticks out to me the most is uber not having a system to keep safety drivers from being complacent what would that system be so something to train them first of all on the importance of 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 paying attention but that's like uh, saying so, like uh, if you're well, going to get behind the wheel you cannot you Look, if there's what I'm saying is you could have no things to keep people from being complacent or you could have several to try to encourage it. And if you do, there's less likely that something like this happens. You could have alarms that go off. You could have like what Tesla has, where if you don't have your hand on the wheel, it, it says, hey, you know what? You need to get back to doing this. Yeah, I uh, I had the same question pop up in my head, Sarah. Like, what else could they do? And there are probably a number of things. And who knows what they already did? There's probably a list of of things that they do do to try to keep those people attentive or whatever? Well, no, according to the NTSB, they did not have a system to keep safety drivers from becoming well, complacent. And, but that, so I mean, anything they could have done. A, like, it's such a larger conversation, right? It's like, if you are driving a vehicle, you you are the driver of a vehicle. I mean, you are, you got to be on point 100% of the time, right? Because you're not, you're not sitting back and, and being complacent ever. But if you were a safety driver in an autonomous vehicle that's supposed to be working as advertised, you're kind of chilling, right? Just, well, like, the yes, goes, that's, well exactly, that's, what you're doing. that's exactly what the NTSB said is, first of all, this isn't a tested and approved vehicle. This is a test vehicle. And as such, you need to make sure that your drivers aren't complacent. 
On top of that, I think you're right, Sarah, that this is going to be an issue for autonomous cars for the foreseeable future until they get to the point where they can be fully autonomous, that we're yeah. going to have to come up with ways to make sure that people keep paying attention so that they can take over if there is a fault. Use some of that computing technology they're using to make these cars drive themselves. Use some of it to notice that you're on your phone and go, hey! Get off your phone. Right. No. And that's why I mentioned Tesla. Tesla already does this with their autopilot system. It, it tries to, to bug you to make you pay attention. Now, arguably, maybe it doesn't do that good of a job. I don't know. I mean, that's a separate conversation. But what with the NTSB was saying here is, look, this was a complex issue and there were a lot of factors and not any one of them was the reason. But if you'd done these things, it's less likely that it would have happened. And having any kind of way to keep the driver from not paying any attention would have possibly saved a life. Well, thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit. You save lives every day by giving us news that we may not have seen otherwise. Voting and submitting stories, dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Keep them coming. Uh, we love the feedback. Join in on the conversation in our Discord as well, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got a couple good ones. First one from Allison Sheridan, friend of the show. Uh, Allison said, two thoughts on self-driving cars. Speaking of self-driving cars, uh, learning about the selfishness, uh, selfishness level of drivers, which is cool. So Allison says, Steve and I are constantly noting that the Tesla sees somebody turn in front of us and can't tell that the car is moving at a rate and with enough momentum to make it across well before we get there. And so it freaks out and slams on the brakes or sets off an alarm. A, a, a timely, uh, timely email that it just sort of, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is, yeah. I mean, based on our conversation, it's sort of like, that sounds like what it should do, even though it's being a little bit dramatic, right? Like right. It, it's it over should err on the side of like save people at all costs. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's a point at which overcorrecting this would make it riskier because then you're more likely to have someone hit rear end you because it's doing this and it's an unexpected that's behavior. True. That's but true. that's our, that was our whole conversation yesterday is if the car can start to tell the intention and be like, Oh, that, that car is turning. I don't need to slam on the brakes because it's got plenty of room. Uh, then that, that makes all of this better for everybody. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of emails from folks worried about Rob DeMillo uh, after he talked about sleep tracking yesterday. Uh, and some of them were saying, oh, I think you have this, this medical problem or that medical problem. And you didn't talk about seeing a doctor. Are you just trying to self-diagnose? So Rob was nice enough uh, to write us a little email today saying, dear DTNSers, Thanks to all of you who wrote in expressing concern for my health and well-being with regards to my sleep patterns and sleeping disorders in general. Please rest assured that I take my health very seriously, especially as I unwillingly age. I'm kicking and screaming into the future. And I know that home remedies are not an adequate replacement for calling in the professionals. The tools that I described on DTNS are meant to be used as guidance and confirmation of the impact of small changes in one's daily habits, but are never intended as a replacement for help from physicians. I'm already working with doctors and sleep disorder experts on potential causes for my issues, so I am getting professional assistance. However, being a technologist, I cannot help but do my own data collection and analysis of my sleep issues, as well as data collection of the rest of my health and habits, and I don't anticipate that stopping anytime soon. By monitoring my sleep patterns with low-cost, low-invasive technologies, I've been able to make changes in my daily and nightly routines that have impacted my sleep positively, so that will continue, and I'm happy to continue to report on new technologies and techniques going forward. Thank you again for all of your concerns. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm there as UberRob. If if you'd like to start a discussion or see what sleep tech I'm tinkering with now. Peace, Rob. Nice. <laughs> Good night, Rob. <laughs> I, I, I want to add to that, that one of the reasons that I didn't bring up the like, well, it sounds like you have this disorder is I'm not a doctor. I shouldn't try to diagnose Rob any more than Rob should try to diagnose himself. And second of all, his medical problems are none of my business. The point of our conversation was like, ooh, what is the sleep tracking tech you're working with? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, we, what, we didn't what want to What tools do we have at our disposal, not being doctors or sleep specialists? Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we can, you know, get a little bit more insight on, on what's going on with, with, with ourselves. 
for sure. Hey, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Paul Boyer, Dustin R. Campbell, and Andrew Bradley. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, you're the best. What have you been, what, what have you been doing over the last week? Well, I, as the best, I've been trying my <laughs> hardest to do the best things. Um, you can find everything I'm up to over at frogpants.com. Uh, a lot of sort of rushing around trying to get certain things ready for Christmas uh, that we like to do on our store and stuff. You want to check that out. We're having a huge clearance sale to make room for new things. Uh, so if that's your jam and you are at all a fan of any of the work I do, you can find all of that at frogpants.com. Or you can follow my daily ramblings over on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Hey, uh, we have new Patreon rewards. If you haven't checked them out lately, go take a look. They're all brand new. Patreon.com slash DTNS. And if you stay a patron or become a new patron, which you can totally do right now, by November 28th, you'll get a holiday card with some Len Peralta art on it sent to your house. Of course, you have to give us your address. Otherwise, we don't know where you live. So do go to Patreon.com slash pledges and look for Daily Tech News Show to make sure that we have your address. But uh, if you Give us your address and you're still a patron and on November 28th or become a patron by November 28th. You'll get that holiday card just a way uh, for us to say thank you. We love feedback. Uh, if you want to thank us or, you know, have questions, comments, any kind of feedback at all, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>